That's why we really look at these projects really pretty much in the quarter of the electric load or smaller that are usually very, very nicely sized. The other options are renewable is coming down. We just filed um, one, we just built a one megawatt project in uh, Sutton, Massachusetts. We just filed for the recovery of that at a little, little over $4 a watt. So it's a 900 kilowatt system. You know, just three or four or five years ago, that same system would have been seven or eight dollars a watt. Residential systems have come down from ten dollars a watt to six or seven dollars a watt. Even with the low capacity factor, with the tax credits, the different incentives that are out there, and the real solid carbon reduction that you get from uh, a renewable resource. And if you've got that in one of your corporate goals, it's key that you, you work toward getting some sort of renewable system installed. And most folks have the opportunity to install solar, maybe not that much, but every little bit helps. Uh, wind is a little bit tougher for most customers because they don't have the wind resource there. Uh, fortunately, in, in all the states in New England we do business in, except for uh, New Hampshire, the net metering has gone up to a two megawatt limit. That's huge nowadays. And net metering is simply the fact that your meter can turn backwards if you have more power being generated than you're using. So that nice Sunday afternoon when the plant shut down and you've got a 200 kilowatt array on your roof, you'll probably be exporting 150, 180 kilowatts, hopefully, if you've done your homework on the off-peak usage, dropped your off-peak usage down to where it should be, right? And then you can bank those kilowatt hours at the, practically the full retail rate and use them Monday when you open up. So a huge opportunity now with net metering throughout New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Solar and wind only at this point. In Mass, very unique situation is if you've got a plant in one location in the state and you have the, if you've got a wind resource there, for example, and it's, it pr can produce more power than that particular site needs, you can transfer those credits from that location to another. It's got to be within the same utility, it's got to be within the same load zone, et cetera, et cetera. Just like everything else, there's a bunch of rules. But ultimately, there's lots of that in the works. In Massachusetts alone, we have 130 megawatts of customer-owned generation being in, in the interconnection queue as we speak. Of that number, over 120 is solar or wind. And of that number, probably 100 megawatts is solar being proposed here in Massachusetts and actively going through the interconnection process. And don't be too concerned about interconnecting on-site generation. It has always been difficult for customers and frankly utilities to, to uh, do interconnection in a, in a fairly simple manner. And it's very basic. 25 years ago we didn't want anyone generating their own power because we generated the power and we liked making the money. Things like PURPA came along and said, well that's fine for you utilities but we're going to change the rule. So you, now, because prior to PURPA, we, a utility could tell you, no, we're not going to let you connect that generator, believe it or not. So that's why laws like that had to be passed. And what's happened more recently is there's been a lot of standardized interconnection procedures set up in all the states, most of the states anyway, and now it becomes much simpler to go through the process. I, I can only speak for New England and New York and, and know that. Um, the process is simpler, unfortunately, because of the volume of the number of projects it's still taken four or five or six months to be able to do the proper analysis to make sure it won't cause problems for your neighbors. But again, when you look at these types of options, along with the chiller plant project or the lighting project or the, or the index real-time pricing or the, or the automated load management, you know, between the ch all those, except for the index pricing, have tax credits and have rebates from someone that you can take advantage of. And since you're all contributing to the bank for those rebates, on the electric bill you see the system benefit charge, and the gas bill you'll see the system benefit charge. You're putting money in the, in the energy efficiency bank. You have to take withdrawals or someone else will, will, will get your money. You don't have a choice but to put it in the bank. It's, it's, it's state law. So take the money out as much as you can. The same with, with different renewable energy funds that are available in different states. It's on the bill. It's your money. You're giving it up whether you like it or not. So take advantage of that money while you can. 
when we talk with customers about energy, it becomes very clear that as you go through for a long, and we were guilty of this as, as worse than anyone else, that you had a particular thing you wanted a customer to take advantage of. So very narrowly focused, you said, okay, wow, you have an old chiller. Back in the days when the, the refrigerant, the um, R11 had to be exchanged. We did lots of chiller projects. Lots of people had to change out their, their big air, um, air conditioning systems. And that's what we concentrated on. But we didn't do a good job making sure, well, gee, if you don't do the lighting, your air conditioning load will be higher than it should be. So if you do the lighting, you lower your air conditioning load because of the heat loss. I mean, the, 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 the heat the lamps and valves give off. And therefore, your chiller plant can be better sized. So the combination of all these things is where it really works to your advantage. Because that's where the true significant savings come in. You do a lighting project in your facility, sometimes it gets awful hard to see that change on the electric bill. You know, there's a two to five percent gray area I, I see on the electric bill. And based on how hot it was, how cold it was, how many people were in the building that day, how much production you did, there is this gray area of the bill that varies month to month. That's the same gray area a lot of different folks who sell black boxes like to play in because it's almost impossible to prove it worked or it didn't work. And we deal with lots of those issues as well here. And we are a good resource to come. If you've got a, a, a vendor looking to sell you equipment that seems too good to be true, it likely is. Unfortunately, in many cases, they come through the executive vice president's office, so you end up having to you know, deal with these folks, talk with them. But at the end of the day, we've looked at lots of those different um, gizmos and magic uh, boxes. And um, you know, if there's not good, solid, solid physics behind it, it's probably not going to work. Someone who claims to save you any more than 10 or 20 percent with a box is just not, it's just not going to happen. It just can't happen. It's just that simple. The physics aren't there for it. Um, you can get into things like power factor correction, installing capacitors, and if, you, if you're billed on power factor by your utility, you can save money. But not all customers are billed on power factor. So you can improve your power factor all day long. You won't save yourself a dime. Now, if you put enough of it in, you can reduce the current flow through your system and be able to install additional equipment without upgrading your main switch, which is just a, as good a reason, because that'll save you money over time. But remember and look at your billing. Ron also talked earlier today, just what are the basics? Am I on the right rate? What, what is my usage from time to time on electric and, 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 your, uh, and your thermal needs? So what we talk about with customers now is figuring out what's, the long, what's your long-term energy plan? For a long time, it's been way down on people's list because the economy was booming, they're growing, they're expanding, and energy was a small piece of their total budget, 5 10% maybe, unless you're a big process industrial customer. It rarely wasn't more than that. So it didn't seem that important to study it and work on it that much. You'd be surprised how many customers we go to visit from the utility or account execs who just aren't interested in, in doing efficiency projects. They're, they've just got too many things on their plate. But in today's day and age, lots of corporations have different needs, different desires. They want to be green. They want to be seen as green. So let's take advantage of that corporate uh, desire, bring forth to different uh, internal folks the opportunities that the utilities are providing with rebates, engineering studies, review of projects you're already looking at, the combination of, comb of pulling that in with something Aronach might bring to you about some sort of index price. Well, how do I make sure I don't hit that 22 cent a kilowatt hour? What do I need to do there? Happy to work with you and your partners to make sure you're taking full advantage of the programs the utilities have, because there is more money than ever for efficiency programs. Uh, there's a lot of additional money in the different capacity markets throughout the country within the restructured markets. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. It does get difficult if you're not immersed in it every day to understand it all. That's why partners like Enernock and your local utility are very important to have so they can help you wade through all the difficulties out there. But it really comes down to a multi-year plan. Just like any other plan your business has, you've got a multi-year plan for expansion or, inc or increasing customer service or making employees happier or whatever you want to call it, right? 
we should have the same sort of plan that you can get some internal buy-in. And if it is a carbon reduction plan, all the better. Because that really drives home the issue related to efficiency and load management. You know, the average um, pounds of carbon per kilowatt hour in New England is about 0.9 pounds per kilowatt hour. The marginal rate, or peak rate, when we're running a lot of single cycle gas engines and a lot of oil peakers can be up to two pounds per kilowatt hour. So it's, it's, there's also the advantage, besides just reducing total energy, there's also a significant carbon advantage by reducing it at the right hours. We're actually working with the ISO and other parties to figure out, because the re, what you re, we really need, just like you've got your energy over time and looking at interval data, it's important for New England to understand, based on your fuel mix, based on your supplier, what your carbon footprint is. It's not going to be the average value based on how you use uh, power and when you use it. So the energy plan really works toward a lot of different c corporate green initiatives people have. It also allows you to understand where the budget money will come from in terms of internal budget money. Because every we're going to pay about half or, or so for most efficiency projects. There's other renewable opportunities and tax credits that'll pay 30, 40% of renewable projects. So when you combine all those different opportunities together and get internal buy-in, that over the next four, three years, five years, whatever it is, I'm, we're gonna commit to spend X dollars over the next five years to reduce our carbon footprint. Or better yet, look at a goal of 10%, 15%. In Massachusetts, there's a Massachusetts Governor's Energy Challenge. That's just what it is, 10% reduction in carbon over three years. In order to do that, you need to understand just what am I going to do here? How am I going to do that? When we talk to different customers, <laughs> the larger customers I've shown here, some of the universities here in Massachusetts at, between NSTAR Electric and Gas and, and National Grid we've been working with, try to get those commitments. The colleges have a little different viewpoint, I think, on lots of things. They, they've got their green initiatives out there that really motivate them to do different things. They've got a significant interest in their student body because every college student interest is interested in renewable energy uh, nowadays. You know, 15